to acknowledge that we are meeting on the land of the uh, Bidjigal and Gadigal people who occupied the Sydney coast, being the traditional owners. On behalf of the Randwick Local Planning Panel, I acknowledge and pay my respects to Elders past and present and the Aboriginal people, any Aboriginal people who may be in attendance today. The uh, meeting today is to consider the determination of several development applications and a modification application. We'll deal with them uh, on in the order that's on the speakers list. Um, the panel members uh, today uh, for uh, will be considering this. Gary West is my name. I am the chair. We have two uh, expert members, uh, Heather Wharton and uh, uh, Deborah Laidlaw, and our community representative is Michelle Finnegan. And uh, we also have uh, council officers, uh, Frank uh, and Louis uh, Curry, uh, also online. Um, this meeting is being held in this way uh, uh, due to the... He is uh, now joining. This, this meeting is being held in this way uh, because of the uh, coronavirus and the precautions that we're asked to uh, comply with. So I'm requesting that uh, we're all considerate and respectful of each other and remain, as, as Frank has said, on mute until I ask you to speak. Uh, I also request that none of you interject while others are speaking. Uh, and uh, otherwise I'll have to ask you to uh, no longer take part in this teleconference. The panel uh, operates in terms of a code of conduct and operating guidelines, which have been modified to facilitate the effective functioning of this panel under these obviously difficult and trying circumstances. Those temporary changes are available on Council's website. This meeting is being recorded and that recording will be uh, on Council's website following the meeting. In terms of the code, general declarations of interest are provided or have been provided uh, before the meeting by all panel members, as well as specific declarations of interest in relation to the matters to be considered today, and all panel members will be participating. After hearing from individual speakers, the panel will then uh, terminate this uh, teleconference and we will then adjourn and then rejoin as a panel to uh, progress to debating the matters and making our determinations. If we, as a panel, require more information, we can defer uh, and a future public meeting, uh, or we could be dealt with electronically, depending on the information that is required. The, uh, the panel decision and the audio recording will be made available on Council's website as soon as possible. There is to be no other recording of this uh, meeting uh, other than the official recording. Um, so today we'll deal with, the, firstly, the first item is uh, number one, King Street. Uh, we have a number of people who've registered to speak on this. It is our usual practice to hear from any councillors who've uh, registered to speak. Then we hear from uh, people who've then registered from the public. And then lastly, we hear from the applicant or a representative of the applicant. Uh, it's a usual practice to allow, is to allow each speaker three minutes to present, including uh, speakers representing community groups, individuals and the applicant. Um, if you have uh, registered to speak, you, you will be recorded. I will give you uh, my mic will stay uh, uh, not muted. Um, I will uh, give you a 30-second uh, message uh, to uh, for, for winding up, uh, and then, you, as Frank has said, to unmute your phone, you need to press star six. The panel uh, has been provided with a copy of all of the submissions received in response to the public exhibitions of the DAs, so therefore there's no need for speakers to repeat the points made in those submissions. I ask that each speaker may be heard in silence while they are addressing the panel and as a courtesy and a courtesy and respect be observed throughout the meeting. There's to be no personal criticism directed at any speaker or council staff, as, as such criticism would be contrary to the code of conduct and will not be accepted. At the conclusion of each person's presentation, the uh, I will invite the panel members to, as to whether they have any questions seeking clarifications of what a presenter has said. If not, well, then we'll move to the next speaker. As I've indicated, after hearing 
from all the speakers, we will then adjourn and uh, make our, our decision, and the decisions will be uh, uh, put on the um, uh, up on, on the Park Council website. So if I turn, the first item is number one, King Street, Randwick, and we have Councillor Nielsen, uh, who's registered to speak. Councillor Nielsen, could you please join uh, the meeting? Councillor Nielsen, can you uh, unmute your phone? Yes, thank you, Chair. Can you hear okay. me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Good. I'm very sorry that we're going to lose this single story early Federation weatherboard cottage. And I'm pleased that as compared to the original plans, the amended plans have reduced the bulk and scale of the proposed development. However, I'm amazed at the cost of works, um, 791000 with all due respect, I can't believe this is going to produce a quality building. I hope you will investigate this. I support the non-standard conditions, which I believe will contribute to providing a better amenity to the residents of the boarding house. As I've already said, I'm sorry to lose this single-storey early Federation weatherboard cottage. I would request that the panel consider adding additional non-standard conditions relating to heritage, for example, that uh, one, an archival recording of the property shall be prepared and submitted to and approved by Council's Director City Planning in accordance with Section 80A, in brackets two of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act 1979, prior to a construction certificate being issued for the development. This recording shall be in accordance with the New South Wales Heritage Officer sorry, Office 2006 guidelines for photographic recording of heritage items using film or digital capture. Three copies of the endorsed archival recording shall be presented to council, one of which shall be placed in the local history collection of Randwick City Library and another to the Randwick and District Historical Society. And secondly, a salvage plan shall be prepared and submitted to and approved by Council's Director City Planning in accordance with Section 80A2 of the Environmental Planning and Assessment Act 1979 prior to a construction certificate being issued for the development. And the salvage plan is required to ensure that materials including fireplaces, architraves, skirtings, windows, doors and remnant components of significant heritage fabric are carefully removed and sold or donated to a heritage salvage yard to facilitate the conservation of other buildings of a similar period. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, can I just ask Council staff, have you got a copy of uh, those um, matters that uh, Council Nelson's raised? Yes, I have. That was forwarded on to me. So I will then forward it on to all panel members. Right. <clears throat> Thank you. Is there any questions from any of the uh, panel members? No. No? Okay. Th Thank you, Councillor Nelson. The next uh, person uh, is Anne Robinson. Anne, can you come in and join the, the meeting? Thank you. Yes, yeah. I, I'm here. Right, good. Shall I start? Yes, you, you um, can start. Yep. <laughs> Okay, I'm speaking to you as a proud resident of this neighbourhood since 1962 and lucky enough to be living in a block of lovely workers' cottages. Mine was built in 1914. Uh, I want to raise objections regarding the development because it does not meet the minimum standard for car parking, which is set out in clause 292E 2A, double uh, I 2A, of the affordable rental housing set. That clause indicates there should be a minimum of 0.5 car parking spaces per room in a boarding house. This plan indicates that there would only be one car parking space and a go-get space. So the minimum standard of 0.5 spaces would require four spaces for this building. There are not four car spaces, only one space plus a go-get car. As the go-get car can only be used by the go-get vehicle parked there, this is not a second space specifically for the use of lodges. It's only available for the go-get car assigned to that space. So the proposed development only has one car space in effect. The heading in the state government affordable rental housing set for boarding houses says car parking rates for boarding house developments. Nowhere does it indicate that motorcycle parking or bicycle parking substitutes for car parking. This is an extremely busy area due to the TAFE, the UNSW campus next door, the bus depot and the residents in surrounding buildings without car spaces, plus the new ambulance super station that's currently under construction. They've just taken four parking spaces for their driveway and at least 40 car spaces in the TAFE College where they're building their super station. The TAFE car park is now full 
well before 9am and hundreds of people are driving around in circles looking for non-existent car spaces. This development would insert eight more people, seven of whom would not have a car space. I know Council's report on this development mentions another boarding house at 279 Avoca Street where the Pan Randwick Planel Council planning panel accepted that one car share space was the equivalent of providing three normal car spaces. That's a quotation. It's impossible to argue with this as this is an assertion by the panel and it's not based in logical fact. One car space is one car space, as I think you'll find if you ever try and park. You can't park over the top of an already parked car and you can't drive a go-get car if someone else is driving it, nor can you park in the go-get spot in, in another vehicle as it is illegal. So I'm not sure how the panel accepted that one fat spot is in fact three spots. We have a resident parking sticker, but we frequently park more than two blocks from our home, are unable to unload groceries, etc., because the parking is so dire around here and the resident parking rules are poorly enforced. This will only be added to with the ambulance superstation. Please refer to all my other objections, which I also consider to be valid objections to this oversized and detrimental addition to the neighbourhood. While the well being of the community <coughs> state has uh, may not be required to be considered under the affordable housing step, I strongly consider that the council has an obligation for the well-being of this community a duty of care for the safety of its neighbourhoods. I would note this development has no on-site manager, thus all the problems would fall to the residents and the overstretched resources of the police to fix. This developer's had three attempts to get this through and still cannot meet all the standards required. He rented his property to a drug dealer before he moved in. Uh, the council has had to impose seven non-standard conditions in order to even make this building uh, workable. Yeah, likely misbehaviour of the residents within, including noise after hours. As the council has been unable to enforce even minor parking restrictions in this neighbourhood, how do they plan on enforcing behavioural conditions on troubled individuals? We live on 202 uh, square metres. Uh, this uh, building's on 171. Yes. Okay. You've finished that now? Well, not really, but I've got one paragraph, that's all. Right. Okay. Thank you. Just that one paragraph. Thank you. Okay. This building will house eight people in 171 square metres, which is a recipe for disaster. Please do not approve this oversized eyesore. Council planners not, will not be around to fix the issues which will arise once this tiny spot is filled up. A three-storey house is considered unacceptable on this site, so I cannot see how this can be approved. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> and, and we did uh, see your submissions uh, and uh, well aware of your concerns uh, in relation to this matter. And, and again, the difficult circumstances under which we're having to meet and, and do these determinations. So, thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. The next uh, person is Paul Sellers. Paul, are you there? You there, Paul? Can you hear me okay? I can now. Yes, you're online now, Paul. Paul. Thank you. Um, Councillors, panel, I address you both. As or as the owner of 3 King Street, local heritage item number 399, which is directly adjoining the proposed development, and as an established resident and Randwick community member, I would like to point out to all attendees today that this particular DA proposal has more objections to it than any of the other five proposals being discussed in this meeting of the RLPP today. As the directly adjoining property to the proposal and the heritage listed item at that, it is important to point out that the shading diagrams provided appear to show that western sunlight to my house will not be blocked by the development to our backyard between the key hours of 1 to 3 p.m. The fact that it's been hidden from council is that due to the proximity, size and scale of this building, it will definitely block crucial sunlight to the inside western living areas of our house and its heritage character features, such as the lead light stained glass windows downstairs and our upstairs windows as well, as it completely overshadows our house. The proposal says that its building, its building will receive adequate solar access, however, at our expense. Is it not council's responsibility to ensure that adequate solar access, uh, sorry, that heritage listed items rather, are protected in order to ensure a healthy respect for the past? This building being proposed will not protect the heritage of our city. It will only obscure and degrade it. The objectives of the Randwick, uh, Randwick Development Control Plan plan 2013 state that quote to ensure that the scale and form of any development is consistent with the predominant scale and form of adjacent heritage items this development application does not meet this requirement as these aspects are in direct contrast and will overwhelm the adjoining heritage property that is my house since this proposal does not meet these characteristics as established in the Randwick DCP 2013 this development application should be denied 
I am a proud and established resident of Randwick who has lived here for over 40 years and in this house for nearly 20 years. Like many of my fellow objectors, I am a keen student of the proud history and heritage of Randwick City, and I do not wish to see its beautiful charm ruined by this greedy, oversized and inappropriate proposal being applied for by people who only moved here in the last five to 10 years and have no interest in maintaining or preserving this area as they will not be living in their own development. It is important to note, councillors, that similar development at this site has been proposed before over the last 10 years and has been rejected numerous times as the size, scale, form, and purpose of this development application have remained unchanged in all that time, this is yet another reason why this proposal should be developed again. This version of the proposed development has been scorned and rejected by not just the immediate neighbours to the property, but by residents from other streets around Randwick as well. This is a clear indication that this proposal is only desired by the people proposing it. This development application, as my fellow speaker has also noted, will only bring disrepute to this area, as well as increased unnecessary stress, worry, and a need for security and emergency presence to an already strained system. As a representative for the residents of this area of Randwick, I say again, this development is way too big for the land size, and it is definitely not appropriate for the houses in this section of Randwick. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Now, I forgot to ask earlier, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, do panel members have any questions of Paul? Uh, Deborah Laidlaw here. Um, Paul, could I just ask you on the shadow impacts? You, you, the, 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 the shadowing is on the rear side of uh, the, the, the effective elevation. What, what are the rooms at, on that side? It's our living room on the western side of our house. Adjacent to so the around, lane on, on the lane. On the lane. Sorry. On the on the on the side closer to the lane, is that, is that the living area or? No, the side closest to John Lane is uh, by our kitchen. Mm -hmm. That's at the south end. The the side that we're concerned with is the western side, which will be our live, our lounge and dining rooms, um, which would be blocked by the the uh, eastern side, edge of the proposed building. Right, so if you're going down that western side and you're moving from King Lane down that western side, um, can you just as you go from the King, King Street rather to the lane down the western side, could you just explain as you progress down that side what the rooms are and the windows? Uh, from King Street to John Lane, mm -hmm. our first one would be our lounge room window and then yep. the next would be our dining room window. Right. And which is the one with the lead lights? That's the lounge, is it? Uh, both buildings, both windows have lead lights in them. Right. Uh, lounge and dining. Yeah. Yeah, I thought that was just one. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Any other panel members got questions? No, Gary. No, right. Uh, now, I forgot to ask you if any panel members got questions of Anne. Has anybody got questions of Anne Robinson? No? No, Gary. Okay, no, thank Gary. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rachel Clark. You there, Rachel? You there, Rachel? Can you hear me? I can now, Rachel. Yes, you're online now. Go for it. Okay, right. very, very simply, um, I'm a person that has a disabled sticker. There's very little parking in the area and the intention is by this owner builder to take up spaces regardless of what he says. Um, it's very hard for me. I can't park outside my house, which is in John Street. I have to park at least three quarters of the way up King Street because there's never any parking there. Not to mention the fact that the building that they are proposing will tower over Paul's house and take away the sunlight from my garden during or midday onwards, probably until about four or five when the sun dips as it goes round. Um, I would also like to mention that race days are a huge problem for us. I've caught people urinating and defecating in John Lane. We have no idea what sort of persons are going to inhabit this building. Um, we know that, or at least I am very well aware of the fact that the gentleman rented his house previously to a drug dealer because I myself called the police at least on a dozen times to that property, which for me doesn't say very much 
um, the character of that house is so important to this area. Those little workers' cottages have so much character and have been tenderly looked after by their owners. I, I don't understand why the council would simply approve something. I understand that the uh, New South Wales government um, has a say in this matter, but reason surely must must abide here. There must be some sort of limit where you can say, look, we really can't do this. It's, it's unfair to people who have lived in this area for years. I've lived in John Street for almost 30 years. So I'm very well aware of all the problems, the tape problems, the new ambulance station, what we had to put up while they were building, building the light rail, all that sort of thing. So health wise for me, and also I noted that the garage on the corner of the bike, the bike garage had their representation turned down for the simple reason that they didn't have sufficient parking. So I have a big question mark about all of that, and I'm just wondering what it is. 30 that seconds. The, yep, okay, that, that would, would push the council to agree to this kind of, of, of construction. It, it baffles me entirely. Okay, you finished on that one? I have. Yep, thank you very much. Uh, you, we certainly will give very good consideration to everything that's being raised. Are there any questions that uh, panel members have of Rachel? No. 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 Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next uh, person we have registered is Tony, Tony Wheeler, who's the architect for this uh, development. Tony, are you there? I am. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, uh, this is a proposal for a boarding house of eight boarding rooms. There's a report from Council which uh, deals with most of the matters that have been raised uh, in a very thorough way. And uh, we're pleased to see that report and we support what's in there. I uh, just want to deal with a few things um, raised in the discussions today. Uh, we've designed approximately 25 boarding houses for both not-for-profits and private uh, owners over the last 10 years as the SEP ARH has been enacted. It might come as a surprise to the residents as to exactly who will be boarding in boarding house rooms. It's a, it's a very uh, disappointing use of the word boarding house because they're in fact rental accommodation for people who are not able to afford a house but are not in social housing. So as to the idea of troubled residents, that's not who occupy these. And we have extensive experience of this. There's people who are paying rent and paying rent at quite a handsome fee to, but less than what you would pay for a one or two bedroom house in the area. It's really necessary to accommodate those people because not everybody can afford a house in Randwick and then live uh, close to work or whatever else they might be doing. Uh, the um, the building is a permissible use as a boarding house. It's permissible in size, setback, scale. There are a couple of things that we have been debating with council over a period of time. One is to do with the car parking, which has been increased from the original proposal. So it does effectively have two cars. But in our experience, very few people in the boarding houses have cars. The whole point of actually having a less expensive rental property close to public transport is because you can take advantage of that. Um, so I am pleased to see Council's report supporting it. We've worked very closely with Frank Coe and Mr William Jones to try and reach uh, an agreement about the form of the building um, which will be compatible with the area. There's a heritage item next door which is in fairly poor repair and very um hard, hardly worth you know with its money Alabama tiles and so on hardly worth the name of a heritage item and i understand in the report that uh, on page 12 it points out that that building doesn't have actually permission for its current uses as to the matter of drug dealers the owners of the house leased it to the Department of Housing, who put a woman, a woman with two disabled children in there. Now, 
if they're so community minded that they call the police 12 times for a Department of Housing tenant, perhaps they needed to find out a little bit more about the woman and her disabled children and less prerogatively claiming that it's a drug dealer. 30 seconds. It's been, been, you know, it's been... 30 seconds, Tony. Sorry? 30 seconds. Yeah, thanks. Well, that's been regurgitated many times and it's a bit of a... It's a difficulty for the owners in the area because they have to live there with all of this, these, um, these myths abounding. Uh, as to the cost raised by the council at the very beginning, our experience is that it's about $80,000 a, a room for construction and that is actually subject to a quantity surveyor's report for a very high quality building, uh, three quarters of a million, or $800,000 is quite reasonable. I think thank that answers the questions that were raised. Right. Thank, thank you, Tony. Are there any questions uh, from panel members? Uh, I, I just have one, Tony. Um, there is a concern about the accessible car space and how someone using that space would have to go into the lane without currently a public path into the door. Um, in the unit, the accessible unit, which is room one, um, would it be possible to switch the bathroom over to the uh, western side and put a door so that someone using the accessible space could enter that unit directly from that space? Um, you could, but... Um you would then compromise the entrance from within the building. One of the issues for these boarding houses is a matter of permeability. The design already has a door uh, opening and glass door with views onto both the laneway and the street, um, which is less than six metres away from the car parking space. And uh, there is a narrow uh, space along that side of that which would provide access into that door for the disabled person. Um, we looked at whether that access, but it just creates another point of vulnerability in the building. Vulnerability to whom? Uh, to the, to, because that, uh, that space is open but not guarded, it, it, it would open directly into a single room um, from a space that's not overseen. There are no eyes on the street at that point to that door. Um, it would be vulnerable. The, the local residents already raised the issue that there is some antisocial behaviour in the area. Not, I might add, from the current owners or from the future tenants of this boarding house. But we we are conscious that we are very close to the to the race course and to the Tate and to other areas around it. There's a fair number of the public, so we try to make sure that both entrances to the building are highly supervised, I wouldn't want to introduce a third that's not. Okay, further questions, Deb? Well, I think that sorry, the difficulty is that they then come out onto the lane, there's no no path. Are you proposing, you've shown a path on the plan, are you proposing to put one there or? Uh, that's that's the existing that's shown on the, um, the survey. No, there's no, just, in, there's, uh, there, there is no path. On, not no, from site inspection no, anyway. John on the survey that there is a that that there is a concrete curving at that point. Yes. Got a photo. Okay, um, Heather, you have a question. Yeah, no, I was I was there just this morning. There's definitely no uh, footpath, and it wouldn't be very safe. I wouldn't think. Um, to for a disabled person to have to come onto the laneway to enter the premises um, from the accessible space or anyone using that car space if there was no accessible person using the accessible room. I noticed there is a condition of consent um, that refers to the creation of a footpath. It doesn't in council's conditions along, um, along the lane. It doesn't say how wide it has to be though. Um, I just noticed it before, that's condition um, 90E uh, that requires a footpath be constructed. But depending on how, I don't, I'm not sure of the width that would be needed to adequately, um, to make it adequate for a person in a wheelchair. Um, so that's my concern. Well, 
Um, I had a few other questions about the design of the building, just other small things. Um, the communal is the communal, now joining. The communal area is um, 14 square metres um, and in the corner, which is fine, I guess, except I think the council has a condition to say no more than eight people can use the area, whereas the, the um, facility is for eight people. But I just think that's not going to be a little bit crowded out there. and. Um, if there was going to be some sort of approval for this development, I'd want to maybe limit the number of people that were in that space at any one time. Um, that's more of a comment. Also, the floor to ceiling heights. Um, I noticed you've got three metres floor to floor, but you've notated that you will achieve 2.7. Would there be a problem other than the height would raise a little um, having a 3.1 floor to floor height? Okay. Tony? Yeah, can I reply? Yes, sure. please. Yes, please. Sorry, it looked like I was still on mute. Uh, um, the way in which these are constructed is to use a high thermal mass construction, which is necessary because of the acoustic requirements. So we use exposed concrete ceilings in the construction of it. There's no uh, plasterboard put into it. So we do end up with a 2.7, which is the ceiling height required under the uh, SEP 65 um, for apartments and we comply with that. So I don't, okay. I don't think we need to. Uh, it, that is actually quite generous. Most of the boarding house rooms that we do are 2550 in height because, because it's permissible to do them down to 2400, which is a bit too low. Right. Um, I just had another question uh, about fencing. What sort of fencing is proposed along the the um, King Street frontage. I'm not sure if I did see a fencing plan or a street elevation. Um, how there, high is it? Um, it's an open steel vertical picket fence, to be described as, um, and it is. It has a retaining wall at the base to hold in all the the plant area of it, and uh, the. The height of the fence itself is 1,200 above that retaining wall. So it's effectively 1,200 high. Uh, is that to the communal open space? Yes. So will that be adequate in terms of privacy for the people in that area? Oh, I, I don't think we would be looking for privacy in that particular case because most of the, most of the housing and so on around there have open front gardens and uh, most of the... Uh, the street is actually um, open to view, even to the the rear of it, of course, because there's a rear lane. No, I, I'm I'm looking for the plant material to provide the future privacy in that area. You know, there's a tree planted um, both in the public space and also inside the landscape. Essentially, that area is used as a would be used by an outdoor space, probably for people. Um, getting fresh air or probably not getting fresh air by, by smoking since very, uh, there's no smoking inside any of the buildings um, and that would be one, one use it would have. The other thing about it is that this building is located judiciously in an area where there's a very high demand for this sort of thing and the benefits of it, of course, is that it's not very far away from a huge public park, a, a uh, resource that was built over 150 years ago. So um, I would expect that the residents would take very good, make very good use of that public park. Um, park. Sorry, Gary, after I've just got one, one no, more no. Um, question. Um, I noticed the council has put a condition on requiring a washer, washing machine dryer so that each room is essentially self-contained. Um, I can't see on the drawings where this would easily fit onto the rooms because they're more or less at the very minimum size. Um, is that are you comfortable that the washing machine and dryer, obviously in some sort of cupboard situation, can be accommodated in each room and a, and a laundry sink? Uh, we we don't need to provide a laundry tub. Um, we provide a washer and dryer combined under bench in the bathroom and it is plumbed directly into the sewer at the back of the the basin 
There is okay. there's a sink. There's a separate sink in the kitchen and a separate basin in the uh, in the bathroom. So there are already two wash basins in the effectively. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Deb. Did you have any more questions? No. Uh, just um. I'll come to you just then. On, sure. I spoke just on the car share, um, a go get. Uh, did you con consider at any stage having a dedicated car to be shared between the residents? Um, it's it's not economic on any of the ones that we've done, short of about 120 uh, residents. <laughs> so um, you know, it's 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 a factor of much much higher than the uh, the number of residents that that's the collection that go get looked for so um if we were to virtually provide our own private version of go get it would it would go broke okay just one question then because obviously if members of the public have to come onto the site to use that car what sort of um legal facility you uh, intending to place on that space to ensure that they can have access without trespassing? The the traffic report covers that. It's not an uncommon thing to mm. have a lease arrangement for GoGet um, with the usual insurances that are covered for it and an easement is signed over by the owners of the land to GoGet for access to it, to that car. Um, there, there's a limit to that lease which is then renewed so um it, it, so it is the, so go get, so go get uh, is, is now the owners exiting. will have to place an easement or a right of carriageway or something like that have over this space um it, it's a very common leasehold arrangement that go get have entered into in hundreds of buildings so it's yeah. not uncommon. I, we, we've done it in the past, and all I can remember from the lease documents is that the area is leased to them with an easement dedicated in that lease um, for, a, for a limited period of time, usually 15 years, um, and for access to that car for any go get user. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Heather, you're only, I'm not Heather, sorry, you're Michelle. Yes, I do, Gary. Tony, in, I suppose, moving along from the go-get scenario, if you're saying that there's potentially 112 additional people using that car and you've spoken about the vulnerability of the area, how do you maintain a minimal responsibility in the area? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the last part of that question. I missed that, Michelle. How do you minimise the vulnerability of the site itself and the surrounding residents when you've got potentially 112 additional people accessing the go-get car? No, that's that's the number of residents from which go get pool to, to put a car in in an individual building. Um, the, the, it's actually better to have that car being used by members of the public that it is actively being used. I mean, firstly, it's more sustainable to have the car being regularly used rather than just being parked all the time. The second thing is that's people coming and going all the time, and the car is serviced and maintained by GoGet. I, mm -hmm. I think it's a far better thing than a, than a than a stationary private car. Okay, so the residents have expressed their concern about the amount or the lack of parking available and the amount of people that use that that space in Ramwick, and um, so this GoGet car then would be attracting additional people to a an already um, populated area, crowded area? Our, our experience with it is that it, people tend to think about giving up their car in order to be able to access go-get cars. It's not as if there's only one. There's usually quite a number there. Look, it's a changed arrangement of how people view private cars. Um, and I think that that is going to be further challenged in the next five years as people take up the use of electric bicycles, which is why we've got five bicycle places and motor motorbikes the residents of this sort of facility are usually people who are essential workers or have residents outside the city and work somewhere close to this in hospitals or something 
and they they stay there five nights a week, four or five nights a week um, as a sort of permanent arrangement. They can be professional people. They can be people who've um, recently been divorced and want to stay close to their children. The, the the image of it being, you know, old men in blue singlets sitting on the stoop with a beer is, is a very old image. These are people who can afford to pay a rent, which will probably be somewhere in the order of $400 a week. So this is not riffraff, if you like. Um, and it, it's a... It's a commercial situation Unknown where... Unknown participant is now exiting. All right, keep going, Tony. It's, it's not as if the, um, the building will be occupied by people who don't care for it, who, who, who have no um, concern for it. They, they're on a lease, so they can be booted out at any time. So it's, it's not like a permanently arrangement yeah. Um, social housing run by a community housing provider. It, 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 I, I'm really disappointed that the, the word boarding house was used because it leads to the wrong assumptions right from the very start, which I think have set us off on the wrong foot on many of these applications. Okay. Michelle, any further questions? No further questions, uh, Gary. Okay. Thank you. I thank you all, everybody who's uh, provided uh, a submission. Uh, thank you, Tony, and uh, everybody else. We will certainly take into account uh, all that's been said here today, as well as uh, the assessment report uh, and uh, and the submissions that were made during the public exhibition. The next matter I'll do with uh, is 127 Darley Street, because that's where we have uh, people who've registered to speak. Um, Multiple people are now exiting. The next, uh, so I have uh, Councillor Lindsay Shuri. Uh, Councillor, are you there? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Off you go. Great, thank you very much. Um, thank you for the opportunity. Raquel Clark is now exiting. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh. God, that's, it, it's really um, confusing, isn't it? Um, I, I really would hope that the panel would um, uphold the decisions of the previous planning panel and not delete uh, number 2E. Um, this is a beautiful house as I know you you must have seen it Nicole and um, I, I think that the um, is now new exiting is going to um, not be of benefit to the heritage value of the beautiful house and um, I would just like you to to, um, to um, uphold the decision of the previous planning panel thank you Okay, Th thank you. Are there any questions by panel members? Gary. No. Uh, oh, Gary. No. Okay. No, thank, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Uh, we, uh, we have we uh, have Brooke, uh, Brooke Aiken, uh, who's registered to speak. The architect, uh, Brooke, are you there? Hello, Brooke. You there, Brooke? No, not coming in. Okay, if the uh, book's not there, I, I oh, move. Gary, I think when we set this yep. up, we did hear from her. Sorry, Yvonne, go. Yes, so I, I thought when we the meeting started, she was announced, so. Hi, I, I'm here. Oh, you're right here, okay. Right, Brooke, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> I, you just couldn't hear me, that's all. Oh, right, okay. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you for, to the panel for the opportunity to speak today. And I understand that you've all got your, the section 455 and the report prepared by Alexandra Marks, the council planner. So I guess we can all be viewing the same images. To provide you with some background, this 455 is the same proposal that we came to with to the planning panel at DA stage. When this proposal was put to the panel, it had been submitted with the staff report recommended for approval. When it was approved with condition 2E as a one-line addition, which cut, cut the garage extension of two bedrooms out of the scheme, neither myself nor the planner nor his team leader at the council were aware this condition had been entered. The DA approval appeared to be as we had received it prior to the meeting, and only after we lodged the construction certificate up PCA advised us of the condition to be met. So uh, we have today on this project unanimous support from both the planning and the heritage departments at Randwick Council. 
We engage two heritage consultants to work alongside us, NBRS Heritage and Gail Lynch Heritage, when we developed the scheme to ensure that we created one that several independent consultant views would support. Our clients took the responsibility of working on Alawa, this beautiful heritage listed property, very seriously. And we knew the upgrade was very much needed as the 83, 91 and 94 renovations were not well built. We stand by this design as being one that does not detrimentally affect the original heritage residents whilst increasing the house size for a necessity of a burgeoning family. Our clients have four children, including one born a few days ago, and they're planning for a fifth. Their grandmother will live in the self-contained apartment at the back and each child will have a bedroom of their own if the proposal is supported. The photo montages provided in the report of the extension don't fully explain the level to which we've kept the history of this house intact. The garage extension touches the existing wall lightly with a frameless glass window either side, which allows the line of the building to visibly run through it. One new doorway opening is proposed and the original window adjacent is retained and becomes part of the corridor and that's a detail that's highlighted by its new focus of being able to walk around it. The extension is subjugated to the main house facade. It's lower, it's below the eaves of the original house. It uses the same material choice as the shingles of the front, yet in a more contemporary manner. And it maintains an extensive front set setback to ensure it'll be visually receptive element in the building, which satisfies the requirements of Clause 510 of Ramwick LEP and DCP. So I think the question comes down to what is the merit of the design and who is professionally entitled to provide that response and how many professional responses should be considered? So it's, okay, it's an ever controversial and complex task to adapt a heritage building. And in fact, any architectural design, regardless of its nature, will always be reviewed subjectively. Guidelines can only go so far as before it ends with a subjective process. And we've been through a court process before with a different council relatively recently where the council heritage planner was against the proposal, yet when their nominated independent heritage consultant was engaged to act on their behalf, that person's view was strongly in our favour and our case was won. So in that case, the singular subjective negative view was that of the council. In this case here with the Lawa, we have a situation whereby both our professional heritage advisors believe that our proposal is in keeping with the original dwelling. And so do the council heritage planners. So I, I, I do hope that we can agree today this view is also seen by the panel. Okay. And thank you for the opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Blue. Questions from panel members? No, Gary. No, no questions? Uh, yeah, do. I just could you please uh, just talk us through the northern uh, the the window opening and the. Can you hear is me? now exiting. Sorry, I'll repeat that. If you could explain the treatment on the northern elevation um, on the photo montage, it seems to be very dark um, with a the the, the wooden. I don't know, uh, slats or, or, or something of that nature um, being the sort of most obvious element. Whereas on the northern elevation on the plans, that it's quite clear there's um, uh, quite a large open window which I, um, with very narrow slats. Uh, so the photo montage is probably the best um, uh, view of it. So there is a very large window, which is part of the, the um, bedroom, but that window is then... You mean the study? By, uh, the study, sorry. Yes, exactly. Um, uh, and the, the um, panels that go over the top of the window, which provide both privacy and also um, basics, you know, um, ability to shut the, the northern light out, they are in a timber... Um, material that is very similar to the timber of the, shing timber of the shingles on the um, front turret. Um, so aside that, there is shingles. Um, so even though it looks quite dark, it, you know, you can see the photograph of the, um, in the photo montage that the shingles at the front look quite dark as well. They are a darker stained um, shingle. So um, I, does that ex you explain it? Well, I, I think I, I guess the difficulty is, is that if something was to be approved, that the plan is the thing that would be approved, not the photo montage. And the photo montage does show these. Uh, sorry, the plan, the elevation does show these very narrow 
slats and behind it a window. Now, I mean, that window doesn't appear to be of proportions that are consistent with the heritage significance of the building or would you disagree? I would entirely disagree, the, um, but the, the the window is not the thing that you are looking at. It's the, the those slats at the front are there; they cannot be taken away. So you're looking at a textured um, facade. So instead of there being a glass box box that um, I think maybe you're worried that would be the case, you're actually looking at a timber louvered structure that happens to have a glass um, uh, window behind. Well, if I put it a different way, if you were to re hypothetically remove the slats, would you support a window opening of those proportions? Um, why would you be suggesting that? Because the window... No, no, no I'm, just, I'm just asking you hypothetically, because when I'm looking at that elevation, a window of, or a window opening of um, floor to ceiling window of, um, the proportions shown is what I see. Now, as I say, what gets approved is the plan. I'm just wondering what is there in the plan to say that okay. elevation is not what you'll see with a very large window opening behind the quite thin slats. Right. I understand your concern because that's how it is coming across in the um, elevations. Um, but um, A, the basics requires those um, uh, shutters to be um, there at all times and B, privacy also um, requires the, those shutters to be there all the time. Uh, I don't think, I think if that was a sticking point, we would be very happy to reduce that, the size of that window, but your window really isn't the thing that you're looking at from the front. You are looking at uh, a textural nature of the shutters in front of the window and because those shutters are there at all times, only a certain amount of the view is being um, able to be looked out through that window because your shutters are there. So even though the elevation shows a lot more blue, the, though we're showing that blue um, with the, the shutters on their um, you know, direct vertical opening, whereas in, the, in reality, those shutters will probably be fairly... Um, uh, turned so that there's the um, maximum amount of privacy for the occupants inside. And again, I say if that's a sticking point, um, it, it, that is, for us, that is not um, an architectural feature. So if the um, window had to be um, smaller, that's, that's neither here nor there. Um, there would be more more uh, uh, shingles. What we've tried to do is is um, uh, keep the amount of shingles running up from the the, um, the line of the garage. Uh, so you know, there's a, a quality of lightness, and um, you know, it's not a particularly heavy um, extension. Again, reiterating that this extension is subjugated to the, the main house. So we wanted it to feel as light and touch the house as lightly as possible. All reasons why we feel like it is um, very much a recessive design. Well, would you, would, you, uh, you, you, uh, would you call it a contemporary approach or are you trying to merge contemporary with traditional? I mean, what, what's the philosophy behind the, for example, the Skillian roof? as opposed to using a flat roof and then you've got the traditional materials. I mean, just so we can understand a little bit of your thinking behind how you've designed, I understand the lightness sure. of it, but... Mm. Of course, it is a contemporary um, insertion to a, a heritage um, uh, building. Um, the Skillion roof was um, primarily to... Um, you know, we've not got a particularly high gutter line there. So the most important thing for us was to be able to um, get um, the line of the the roof underneath the ridge line, oh, sorry, the, the, um, the eaves line of the existing house, which means, that, you know, say we'd had a, um, 
uh, flat roof, um, we wouldn't have had the, the pits enough to get to the to the other side, you know, to to um, uh, be able to have that as a working a, a good working roof. Hence the, the pits. Our main focus was to have that uh, that um, uh, height as being underneath those eaves line. So the the design is um, you know it was um, expressed as a, a contemporary in, a insertion, um, but it is. Um, uh, using the shingles in a in a contemporary way, so it's it's using the lightweight nature of the the um, uh, material choice at the front, and uh, yeah, um, extrapolating it into a um, a contemporary extension. So you know the life of the building is continuing. There have been um, changes through the building from its 1914. Um, birth to um, a 1943 edition which very much looked like a 1943 edition to then a 1983 to a 1991 edition and again that edition looked incredibly 80s um, made so it, it's um, we certainly didn't want our interventions in this building to be um, a heritage um, uh, faux um, insertion um, but we absolutely wanted the insertion to from the front to meld with the the material choices of the, the front of the house okay thank, thank you thank you panel members any other questions no, no, no. Uh, okay I'm thank sorry. you Thanks very much uh, Brooke thank you thank you uh, very much okay thank you okay Bye. Uh, we have um, uh, Brendan Roberts uh, online in relation to 45 The Causeway. Uh, any questions Brooke that anybody I have of Brendan? Is now exiting. Uh, this is number 45, The Causeway. So, Brendan is the... You there, Brendan? Lindsay Shorey. Uh, you there, uh, Brendan? Is now exiting. Brendan, you there? Hello, Brendan. <laughs> All right. So was Bre Brendan the designer or the Is he no, that's the councillor Roberts that um he's the um he's the owner part oh, owner okay. of the right, he's, he's also sorry. the councillor, yes. Thank you, Frank. Um yeah, sorry. Is uh, okay. So, does is he there online? Uh, Councillor oh. Roberts, if you're online, oh, you know, if you're not sure how to unmute yourself, you need to press star six. No. All I can see is um, I can recognise the number like nine one. The zero four seven seven three four five nine one three. That's uh, that's that's a number I know, but um, the other number I don't know who the other person. There's only two uh, uh, non-panel member and council staff uh, currently in this meeting room. Okay. All right. Um, the Brenda's is not there. Then uh, uh, are there any in relation to two thirty Coogee Bay Road? Is Tanya there? Tanya Hancock. Oh yes, that's Tanya. The the uh, yeah, yeah yes. That's just in case there's any questions of Tanya. Tanya, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Yep, right. Thank you. <laughs> any questions of Tanya by panel members? Yeah. Uh, not getting any other than Heather. No. Uh, you're on. I did have it. Yeah. Uh, no. So, um, Tanya is representing. Who? Sorry. That's two thirty. Two thirty. You better write. Right. Can't you? Oh. Okay. So I didn't realise we're on the next item. Um. Sorry. <laughs> My apologies. Oh. Okay. 
and this is the extension to the large building within the commercial zone. Yeah, this is two thirty. Yes. yes two. Uh, sorry, tenure is here to answer questions. Yes. Okay. What about in terms of the issues raised in the submissions regarding the conditions? Yes, sorry, I can sorry. answer any questions. I can answer any questions about that. Um, sure. I haven't got a yeah. question, but I thought you might have. Oh. No, you haven't got any questions, right? No, no. Deb? I, I just had a question. I want to know the, the materials of the uppermost floor. What's the external materials to be used on that? Oh, hold on, let me just kind of change room. Sorry, this was submitted a while ago, so I just have to refresh myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not actually there on the plans. That's that's why. It, it's a um. It is. Oh, actually, hold on. I just have a collect exactly the same one. It is a metal cladding on that top pentel. Um. Metal. Yeah. What like metal mm -hmm. with a flat profile or? Yes, yeah, like an aluminium standing seam kind of a recessed cladding material. But let me just check that. But yeah. that. We've, there's been quite a few different submissions on this job, so I actually just need to um, bring up the exact current plans that you have in front of you. Sorry, I wasn't. I think we're on D, is it D, D, issue D. Yeah, it's um, a dark grey metal cladding, like a, um, an aluminium. Very looking cladding. Sorry, gone. We like a zinc cladding, but it's the aluminium version of the zinc cladding. Okay, no, oh, that'd be good. Um, and then you're painting the rest of it. Yes. Yeah. And what colour is that going to be? Just. Uh, it was a medium to dark grey. Um, okay. it just gets quite dirty down there, so we don't want it to be too dark. But obviously, it's mm. going to be a dark enough to not has to be repainted every six months. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, right. Michelle, do you have any questions? Questions, Gary. No, okay. Uh, All right. Nothing from you, Heather? No, uh, no. No, okay. Look, thank you, Tanya. Thank you very much. Um, okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I say uh, to everybody, thank you for participating in the meeting today. Uh, not easy. Um, I think we've managed to get through uh, those people that did register to uh, to address us today. Uh, I'll therefore uh, close uh, this this meeting, uh, and the recording uh, will be available um, within seven days uh, on council's website. Thank you all. Declare the meeting closed.